Welcome to the Ophthalmic Project, powered by Ophthalmology 360. Hi, I'm Mark Lugos, Senior Contributing Editor for Ophthalmology 360. Today, the Ophthalmic Project looks at a glaucoma research team that is celebrating its 20th anniversary in 2022. And back in 2002, the Glaucoma Research Foundation launched the Catalyst for a Cure Consortium, a group of researchers and scientists whose main purpose was to develop and find a cure for glaucoma. Now working with its third set of in inst investigators, the Catalyst for a Cure team has made major strides to the goal of finding a cure for glaucoma. Joining me today to discuss the accomplishments of the Catalyst for Cure is Dr. Derek Wellsby, MD and PhD. Dr. Wellsby is Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at the Shilai Eye Institute at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Wellsby is also one of the four investigators of the current Catalyst for a Cure research team known as the Stephen and Michelle Kirch uh, Catalyst for a Cure vision restoration team. Dr. Wellsby, welcome to the Ophthalmic Project. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for having me. Great. Now, before we get into your group, because this, was, I, I thought with the 20th anniversary of, of the uh, Catalyst for a Cure, I thought I'd touch on a little bit of a history. Um, the um, Maybe some of our listeners aren't familiar with it. I know, you know, but they have done some incredible things at moving. You guys have done, well, I say you guys, so all you guys have done amazing things over the last 20 years to get reaching that goal. So I just want to start with a little bit of a sort of a history. As I mentioned, the, the, the Catalyst for Cure Consortium is celebrating its 20th anniversary. The Stephen and Michelle Kirch Catalyst for a Cure Vision Restoration Initiative is the third chapter of this incredible research initiative. And all this has been funded by the Glaucoma Research Foundation. Before we talk about the research being conducted by Dr. Wellsby and his team, let's, I wanna provide our listeners with some background on the Catalyst for Cure, where it started and how the consortium has progressed to where it is today. Back in 2002, the Glaucoma Research uh, Foundation initiated its first catalyst, 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 oh boy, catalyst for a Cure Consortium. The consortium consisted of four principal investigators and their laboratories working to get together to accelerate the pace of scientific discoveries that would produce a cure for glaucoma. The concept for the Catalyst for a Cure was totally different from the typical research models, which researchers and scientists work independently to compete for grant money. The Catalyst for the Cure consortiums do their research in collaboration, building on the strengths of each investigator in the group. Now, through, the, through this innovative program, the Glomer Research Foundation is able to recruit scientific researchers from the major academic centers across the United States, including in areas of ophthalmology, engineering, genetic research, and neurosciences. This collaborative approach has attracted many scientists who have not conducted research in glaucoma in the past to, to jump in and accelerate and to well, bring, bring their efforts to accelerate the cure for glaucoma. Now, the first group uh, became known as just the Catalytics for a Cure Neuroprotection. This goal of this group was basically to change the conventional understanding of glaucoma as an eye disease to a new understanding of glaucoma as a neurodegenerative disease. The first researchers were um, David G. Calkins, PhD of Vanderbilt Eye Institute. It's, and also just to a note, uh, Dr. Calkins is being honored with the President's Award at this year's Glaucoma Research's Glaucoma 360 meeting. His other colleagues were Philip Horner, PhD of Houston Me uh, Methodist in Houston, uh, and uh, Nicholas Marsh Armstrong, PhD of the University of California, Davis, and Monica Vetter, PhD of the University of Utah, Salt Lake City. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, uh, Dr. Wellsby. Uh, can you provide some background as to what this first research group set out to do and what they are able to accomplish? Sure. I, I suspect that the listeners are probably from a diverse set of backgrounds. Some people may be familiar with ophthalmology terms and other people may not be. So if it's okay, I might just take a second to give a little bit of background on glaucoma. Is that okay, Mark? That's great. Go ahead. Let's go for it. So, you know, inside of each eye, there's a retina, the part of the eye that's responsible for taking light and turning it into visual information. And each of those retinas has about you know, 1.2 million nerve cells 
lining the retina. And those nerve cells are called retinal ganglion cells. And if you think about each one of these cells, it's responsible for synthesizing the visual information in its little local area, and then carrying that visual information to the brain via its nerve fiber. And so that collection of 1.2 million nerve fibers is what we call the optic nerve. And in glaucoma, these nerve cells are slowly lost over time. So regions of your retina become disconnected from your brain, and that leads to vision loss. It's a neurodegenerative disease characterized by nerve cell death. And the pressure, the eye pressure, is a risk factor. And actually, it's the only thing that we can modify, at least up till now, which is why that's what all the glaucoma specialists focus on. But if you actually, if you look at glaucoma patients, only about half ever have an elevated IOP. Or an IOP is the, the term we say for uh, interocular pressure. So the question was back in 2002, when the first CFC team started, is why are these cells degenerating? And what is the role of eye pressure? Fortunately, there were mouse models of glaucoma. One of them was called the DBA2J mouse model. And another was uh, a model where you induce glaucoma that was developed by the CFC team and, and developed independently by others, including my former mentor, Harry Quigley. So the CFC team studied these various mouse models and they showed really three things. The first was that glaucoma follows a stepwise progression. And what I mean by that is first, you have those retinal ganglion cell nerve fibers, and the, the word we use for that are axons, and that these start to become dysfunctional and sick. Then the next step is that these axons or nerve fibers degenerate, leaving a disconnected cell in the retina. And finally, that disconnected cell, not being useful anymore, undergoes cell death. So that was the first thing that actually it was this first CFC team that established that. The next thing they looked at was what are the genes that change in response to glaucoma? And are any of them responsible for causing glaucoma? And what they saw was a, a signature of immune cells playing a role. And that was surprising. We all knew that retinal ganglion cells must play a role in glaucoma. Those are the cells that die in glaucoma. But it was unexpected that immune cells in the retina were becoming activated and might play a role in these rodent models of glaucoma. And actually, incidentally, they found a drug that FDA here approved called minocycline that reduced some of that immune cell activation and slowed the progression of glaucoma in those mouse models. And the final thing that this CFC team, uh, like one of the really big impacts was looking at the, the role of another cell type called glia. And the key there is that brains aren't just made up of nerve cells, they're also made up of this support cell that plays a tremendous role in so much of neurobiology. And the retina has these glia cells also. And it looks like these glia cells are also involved in the reason that these ganglion cells die. In other words, the ganglion cells aren't just dying because of suicide. There's a lot of other cell types here that are, are prime suspects in, in causing that retinal ganglion cell death and glaucoma. And, and these were tremendous, uh, tremendously impactful discoveries that really framed the research for the next 20 years. And actually now all of their individual labs study how it is that these nerve fibers are being injured in glaucoma and how we can slow it down. So, so that basically that first researchers are still, are still working behind the scenes, that even though they're not participating with the uh, Catalyst for the Cure team, they're still do, taking their research and moving forward with it, correct? Absolutely. And, and that was one of the powers of the CFC consortium is that it can really, I mean, I think all of them would have been successful no matter what, but I'm sure that the CFC helped accelerate their success and all their, I mean, they're not working behind the scenes. I think they're, they're some of the leaders in these fields yeah. uh, of understanding how it is that optic nerve fibers get damaged and how to slow that down. Yeah. Now, I also know from when I was doing some research about the first team, I also, their, their insights uh, they, they project could lead to new ways, to, not only to treat glaucoma, but look at Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or um, ALS uh, and probably other diseases in this family, correct? Absolutely. So, you know, that, that's something that when I tell my patients, it surprises them that they, 
Everyone thinks of glaucoma, oh, it's an eye pressure disease, it's an eye disease. But really the right way to think about it is it's a neurodegenerative disease where a nerve cell is dying. And in our particular case in glaucoma, it's the nerve cell that connects your eye to your brain, which is why you lose vision. But in other neurodegenerative diseases, it's the nerve cells that control uh, motor functions like Parkinson's or memory, like as in Alzheimer's. And so there are some commonalities to why these nerve cells are dying, which is useful because then if you come up with a way to slow or stop the death in one, it might have carryover into some of these other neurodegenerative diseases. That's incredible. The Glaucoma Research Foundation then moved on into 2020, 2012 and then formed the second initiative, the Catalyst for a Cure Biomarker Initiative. Now, the goal of this group, a research team, was to develop novel methods to detect, measure, detect, measure, and to treat glaucoma with unprecedented uh, precision. The researchers on this team included uh, Alfredo Dubra of uh, Stanford University, Jeffrey uh, Goldberg, MD of Stanford University, Andrew Huberman, PhD of Stanford University, and Vivek uh, Sirnivian San, PhD at the University of California, Davis. This research team was asked to identify and develop new specific and sensitive biomarkers to diagnose and manage glaucoma more effectively. Do you have any uh, recollection on some of, what the th some of what this research set out to do and accomplished? Uh, absolutely. So again, I mean, this is uh, a group that has made tremendous impact in the field of glaucoma. So you know, they were tasked with finding biomarkers because if we want to develop therapies that work by lowering the eye pressure, well, that's fine. That's what we've been doing for years. And that's easy to measure. You measure that the eye pressure goes down. But if you want to measure if you have a therapy that's successful that doesn't work by lowering eye pressure, you need some way of, of doing that. And then these biomarkers would make that extremely, uh, would facilitate that process. And so this group worked on something called OCT imaging. So OCT is an imaging modality we have in the eye. And they uh, developed uh, you know, signatures of RGC, a retinal ganglion cell injury and death. And that's certainly work that's continuing to be developed. We know that the mitochondria, the cell's powerhouse, plays a, a real role in glaucoma. And they also found signatures of that mitochondrial dysfunction that could be a biomarker. And indeed, there are clinical trials right now in the world happening to try that, that have the potential to restore some of that mitochondrial dysfunction. And, uh, and impact glaucoma. But here's the interesting thing I think about the second Catalyst for a Cure team. If you bring four really smart people together, uh, you can get innovations that are even outside of what they were tasked to do. So again, this was a group that was tasked with looking at biomarkers, but they made tremendous impact in other fields. For instance, they were the first, uh, members of this group were the first to show that you could actually transplant retinal ganglion cells, put retinal ganglion cells back into a retina that's missing them to, to try to restore function. This group showed that you could give visual and electrical stimulation of the retina and that that could potentially have some regenerative effect on the retina. And that's an easy thing to do. So again, there's clinical trials to evaluate that. Another thing that this group did was some of the early work on understanding that not all retinal ganglion cells are the same. I told you before, there's this 1.2 million that just line your retina. And it's, it's easy to kind of fall into the trap of thinking of them as all being equal and taking like a pixel of your information to the brain, like a pixel of your monitor. But, but actually these retinal ganglion cells do much more complicated computation and there are many different subtypes. And it was part of the second CFC team that, that understood some of that biology. That's great. I, 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 I follow that second group very well. I got really involved with the Glaucoma Research uh, Foundation and the uh, Catalyst for Cure team with, when it, with that second group. And I know they did some incredible invented machines, I think, and stuff like that it was to, to help do their own uh, to move forward with their research. I, I thought to me alone, just, I guess one, a couple of guys were engineers, if I don't remember, if I remember right. Uh, That's right. They had tremendous but, talent. 
Yeah, great. Okay, let's we'll move on now to the third chapter, which is your group of uh, Catalyst for a Cure team and this consortium. Obviously, it's it's being sponsored, uh, I guess, by Stephen and Michelle Kirsch, uh, and, they, and they have got the title for the Catalyst for Cure team as the Vision Restoration Initiative. And this was group your group was launched in 2019. So before we go anywhere, what your what your group are doing? Let's let's talk about your team. Uh, you know, who, who's on the team, what are the backgrounds, what are the disciplines to uh, bring to, to the whole team, and also what are each of the respective labs focusing on? So there are four of us, and in no particular order, we have Shin Dewan. He's a scientist at UC San Francisco and an expert on retinal physiology, the retinal ganglion cell subtypes that we just discussed, and the regeneration of those nerve fibers, or what we call axons. Second is Anna Latore. She's a scientist at UC Davis, and she's an expert in retinal development and stem cell technology. Third is Young Hu, a scientist at Stanford, who is an expert in uh, genetic engineering and animal models of glaucoma. And then the fourth member is myself. I'm a physician scientist at UCSD. So I see patients, operate, and have a lab that works on neuroprotection and high throughput genetic screening. And we'll talk about some of that probably uh, in the next few minutes. Great. Um, so basically, what, what are the goals and objectives that have been set out for you as the vision restoration team? So you know, the, the, the easy way to summarize that is vision restoration. We wanna bring vision back, but really that breaks down into two goals. So I, I, I lump them into a neuroprotection goal and a retinal ganglion cell replacement goal. So let me talk about each of those. So for, for neuroprotection, like how does that fit under vision restoration? It sounds like it's just protecting what you got, but as I mentioned earlier, like that first CFC team found that glaucoma is characterized at its very early stages by dysfunction or sickness of those retinal ganglion cell nerve fibers. And then those nerve fibers degenerate and then only late into that process do the cells die. So you can imagine, and, all, and also I should mention, for a lot of our glaucoma patients, you know, we do visual acuity measurements, but we have them read the the eye charts, we test their visual field, but these tests are rather crude at capturing all of the visual problems that a patient might have with glaucoma. And so the idea behind neuroprotection as a mode of vision restoration is, if we can come up with interventions that improve the health of those nerve cells and reverse some of this injury, it is very plausible that we could improve the quality of vision for those patients. But even if that hypothesis is wrong and we really can't make much of a, a dent in someone's vision by just protecting what they've got, you gotta remember that for most patients, they haven't gone totally blind from glaucoma. And if I could tell them today, like, hey, there's this therapy that pretty much is gonna keep what you got, for so many of my patients, that would be a huge win. So, so neuroprotection is, is, a, is a goal for this team. And I think it's an important and lastly, on the neuroprotection front, even to, to replace cells, and I'll talk about that in a second, replacing cells is a fantastic goal to bring back vision to those patients who are already blind. But those cells that get replaced are gonna have to live in an eye that's got glaucoma. In other words, they're gonna have to be protected from that glaucomatous injury. So neuroprotection is relevant to vision restoration. And that's why it's a major uh, focus of this third CFC. The other goal for our team is just frank visual uh, restoration by via replacement. In other words, if someone is blind because they've lost retinal ganglion cells, we want to be able to replace those retinal ganglion cells. And so the team is working on that, but that comes with challenges. And, and these are the challenges that, that we have set out to, to overcome. You've got to first off create a cell. You know where, where are you going to get your retinal ganglion cells from? You got to get them into the eye, position them in a place where they go into the right part of the retina, get them to integrate into the retina, make all the right connections with the other retinal cells, 
have their fiber regrow itself back to the brain, make the appropriate connection to the brain, and make sure that they survive before they before all these steps are, you know, while all these steps are being completed. And so each of those are, are the goals for this vision restoration team. We have to tackle all of that if we're gonna make this successful. Great. So how has the achievements of the first two groups of, the, of researchers helped the vision restoration team in developing and achieving your goals? I mean, how's, how, how, obviously they've set the, the groundwork for you to, to do that, correct? Uh, absolutely. And it really, in many ways, I mean, part of it is the understanding of the disease. You know, we, we wouldn't be able to talk about really robust neuroprotective strategies. And when I say neuroprotection, I mean a strategy that's good at keeping a nerve cell alive despite this predilection to die. And we wouldn't even be able to do that without the understanding that was uh, given to us by that first CFC team. Also, as we do transplantation, we need mouse models of glaucoma. We need to be able to image these retinal ganglion cells. We need to be able to transplant them. And this is all work done by prior CFC teams. So if you kind of summarize, like I would say all of the tools and the paradigm has been established by prior CFC teams. And, 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 and quite frankly, other labs also working on this and making big contributions. Yep. Now the vision restoration team is now in its, its third year now. Um, uh, your science has been working together in search of innovative ways to replace, repair, and protect neuron, neuronal elements of the eye to brain connection that can be damaged by glaucoma. Can you uh, outline what the team has set out to accomplish? Yeah, I would say in 2019, in our first uh, funding period of, of the CFC, you know, we recognize that this is going to be a multi-year project. This was not going to be solved in three years. And I mean, people have been trying to uh, regenerate optic nerves and restore vision for you know, decades and decades. So we knew, okay, this is a multi-year project. What are the things we need to tackle? And you know, one of the most important ones was that these cells that were being injected to try to replace the lost retinal ganglion cells were dying. And the ones that were remaining in the eye after transplantation, they weren't forming the appropriate connections. So we needed cells that uh, we had to improve their potential to survive and to improve their potential to form connections. We needed to be able to image these cells. And we also needed large animal models that up until this point, everything's been happening in rodents, which is extremely useful. But at some point, we needed to move to large animals. So we wanted a large animal. And by that, I mean a non-human primate or a monkey model of glaucoma that we could test uh, transplantation and neuroprotection. In. So we set out to do those things in the first three years, and it went pretty well. Good. Yeah, I noticed uh, that you know, I, in last year, your team made a lot of dramatic progress uh, uh, of its goal, some of its, in its goals. And, You've been able to develop therapies to transplant new uh, retinal ganglion cells, and, and, and also the team is exploring ways to preserve and enhance the eye's neurological connections. Uh, can you explain what the team has been able to accomplish on, on both these areas, combined, especially the uh, uh, transplant? I think you explained the other ones with the neurological connections, but what it's been doing on with the therapies to connect uh, new retinal ganglion cells? Yeah, so again, remember, we were, we're moving towards trying to replace lost retinal ganglion cells with new ones. So where are those new ones gonna come from? Well, they're probably gonna come from stem cells. We can take a patient's blood from the blood or skin, we can make stem cells. And from those stem cells, we can turn them into retinal ganglion cells. So they would be matched to a given patient. And then the idea is to inject them into the eye in some clever way that gets them to integrate, re replace the lost ones and restore vision. That's the, that's the big goal here. So we realized, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that when you make these cells, they don't, they're not particularly robust. They actually, it's very easy for them to die. And actually it's probably not a coincidence, right? It's why in any kind of optic neuropathy like glaucoma, if you injure the nerve fiber of these cells, it's very easy to get them to die. So, so we needed a way of making these cells 
more robust, less likely to die. And that kind of a therapy would be useful for these transplanted cells. But as mentioned before, we have this two-prong attack. It would be useful for your natural retinal ganglion cells to prevent them from dying. So how did we go about that? Well, we started with human retinal ganglion cells, working with a colleague of mine here at the Shiley Eye Center. That's uh, Dr. Carl Wallen. We were able to make human retinal ganglion cells from a patient here. And in past, we have done something called perturbative genetic screening or functional genomic screening. And all that means is we take a, a somewhat unbiased approach to finding answers. In other words, we get some sort of retinal ganglion cell and we say, you know, I don't know what the best way to keep the cell alive is. So what we're gonna do is just march through the genome one gene at a time and turn each gene down or off. And then we measure, did that make the cell more robust? Did it make it more healthy, less likely to die? And we've done screens like that using mouse retinal ganglion cells. And we had found a gene called DLK that when we inhibit DLK, it is profoundly protective to retinal ganglion cells. And that's great news because that means that that's an avenue for neuroprotection for those patients who still have retinal ganglion cells. And then that's being developed right now. But one of the things that a colleague of mine, uh, Trent Watkins showed was that if we inhibit DLK, we can do a great job of keeping retinal ganglion cells alive, but it comes at a cost. And that cost is these cells don't regenerate their nerve fibers. And so that's unfortunate because that means if we wanna do something like regeneration or replacement of retinal ganglion cells, those cells need to survive and regrow their nerve fibers to reconnect to the brain. We need to have both. So the screen that we set up with was to take human retinal ganglion cells and gene by gene, look for genes that would both give us survival and that would improve the regeneration of their fibers. And so we did this screen, then we used artificial intelligence or machine learning to look for any single gene that might do both. And we found a set of genes called, we call them the GCK4 kinases. It's just three genes that are very related. And then we worked with Young Hu and Shin Duan to show that exactly as the screen predicted, you know, the screen is done on plastic, but working with Shin and Young, we showed that in animal models, when we inhibit these three genes, we improve the health of retinal ganglion cells. They're much less likely to die. And as opposed to stopping regeneration, we actually improved regeneration. And that's exactly what we were looking for. So then we worked with Ana Latore and asked, well, is this true for stem cell-derived retinal ganglion cells in mouse? and in what we were called organoids or stem cell derived retinas in a dish. And what Anna showed was that, you know, if we added a drug that inhibited these genes, just like in our cells, just like in the mouse model, again, we improve survival and we improve their regeneration of the fiber. And that, why is this important? Because those cells that Anna's working with are exactly the kind of cells that we will be using to inject for transplantation and vision restoration. And so it, it was sort of a, we were pretty happy that we were able to come up with this intervention that really should facilitate transplantation. Well, to conclude, but what, what, what you've been able to accomplish this year, what conclusion can you give uh, when you say this year's progress that will give hope to glaucoma patients? Yeah, I would say two things. So on the neuroprotection front, in other words, protecting what you've already got, you know, which would be huge. I can say that, look, in addition to the GCK4 kinases, DLK, and other groups around the world have really come up with a list of neuroprotective interventions. So these are real. This is, this is in the near future. Some of these are in clinical trials right now. Others are going to be in clinical trials in the next year or two. So I think neuroprotection is something that we're talking about in the very near future, not decades and decades into the future. As for 
really bring back vision to patients who are totally blind, look, it's no surprise we don't have a therapy right now. And the good news is that we know what the challenges are. I think I listed many of them. We know there's a clear plan of attack. And we and other labs have come up with ways to tackle them and to improve the transplantation of cells, their integration, their reconnection. Uh, we know there's still significant work to be done, but this is clearly a surmountable challenge. Great. What's, what's the uh, catalyst for Cure's vision restoration uh, since you've achieved what you hear? What direction does the team go moving forward? So on the, on the neuroprotection front, you know, if you think about most diseases in medicine, they aren't treated best with a single intervention, whether it be you know, HIV, cancers, diabetes, really there, there aren't too many examples of single drugs cure everything. It's usually a combination of strategies. So one of the things we're doing now is trying to leverage uh, these neuroprotective strategies, each of their pros to come up with something that's collectively better than the sum of its parts. In other words, some multi-pronged neuroprotective strategy. On the retinal ganglion cell transplantation front, one of the things we've noticed is that different subtypes of retinal ganglion cells, recall they're not all the same, some of these subtypes seem to be much better at surviving, much better at restoring connections. And so we are trying to leverage those properties to make a better candidate cell for transplantation. Now I gotta ask, here's, this is the million dollar question, I guess, uh, with all that has been accomplished by not only the Catalyst for Cure Consortiums, but the other research conducted outside of, of Gl the Glaucoma Research Foundation, how realistically close are we from finding a cure for glaucoma? Uh, right, so I mean, I, I think a cure is a strong word. It sort of implies, oh, it's gonna be this one pill you take once and it, the disease is gone. And, you know, frankly, if I could guarantee my patients that I could turn glaucoma into a chronic disease where they never lose vision, I think most of them would be elated. So, you know, I, I think that's where we are focused is, is just making this a disease that is managed. And, and to some degree, it can be managed for, for, for many patients, but not for all. And we want this to be a disease that can be managed for all patients where they don't lose vision. Um, so that means we need to have a therapy that's robustly neuroprotective. It's got to be safe, easy to deliver. And I think you're gonna see neuroprotection in the near future. So I think it is really not a, a distant goal in my mind. This is uh, in, the, in the 2020s. Great. I, I have to agree with you. I think, if, I think most patients would be totally uh, happy with just being able to continue having their sight and not you know, trying to find a cure, well, maybe hopefully in our lifetime, but if not, to at least be able, the, the intermediate goal would be to help prevent people from going blind. I think a lot of people would be, a lot of patients would be happy with that, so. And, and I would just add, Mark, that for those patients that are already blind, the idea that we can use stem cells and do gene editing and transplant, I mean, none of this was possible 10, 20 years ago. This is all recent development. So it, it's really taken something that was really an impossibility and made it a possibility. Granted, it's a hard challenge and there's a lot of challenges and we and others are working on it, but uh, you know, it's definitely, it's now conceivable how this could all happen. Now, we, you, know, you talked, you could provide, today you provided us a lot of information regarding the catalyst for a cure consortium. Uh, is there anything we might have missed, or do you have any final thoughts you want to discuss about the consortium and the uh, work done by the Glaucoma Research Foundation? Yeah, I, I think the, maybe the only thing we haven't really spoken too much about is the, the CFC mechanism and the Glaucoma Research Foundation. So you know, the, these types of consortia are rare. Um, most labs are sort of independent. And, you know, of course, they have some collaborations, but they're kind of on their own. And this Catalyst for a Cure mechanism brings together people with very diverse talents and skill sets to solve a common problem. Like for instance, my lab was very interested in high throughput genetic screening, but we weren't really working on the problem of transplantation. It was this CFC or the Catalyst for a Cure mechanism that brought us together to work on this. Um, I think that kind of collaborative approach is really the key to solving problems. It's, it's the direction that science is gonna to move towards. It's already starting to move that way. And you know, the other thing I'll, I'll mention is 
part of this CFC, uh, the Catalyst for a Cure, has been to pair these four labs with a scientific advisory board. And they don't get a lot of, uh, you know, we, we don't talk a lot about them, but in the background, there are these, you know, really well-known labs that have lent their expertise, their reagents, their, their criticisms, their ideas to what we work on. And we've gotten better because of that. And so, you know, really the funding, the collaboration, the scientific advisory board, the support of the Glaucoma Research Foundation, all of this has been absolutely critical to making this successful. That's great. And um, before we stop, I, I'd like to uh, talk about, you know, glaucoma, the, the Catalyst for a Cure and, and a lot of other things that the Glaucoma Research Foundation supports. Uh, they support a lot of programs that, especially in, in, to fight uh, blindness and fight to find a cure for glaucoma. And one of the things they do that through is obviously this annual meeting, the Glaucoma 360 meeting. And I, I think this is this year's meeting is February 10th through 12th in San Francisco. And, uh, it has a, the, the annual gala, which, 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 which celebrates and provides recognition for the visionaries, individuals who, who are seeking to find a cure and restore vision through innovative research. And of course, the, Coloma, the meat of the Glaucoma 360 meeting is on Friday with the New Horizons Forum, which is incredible. I, I think it features an all-day schedule of presentations, panel discussions featuring the CEOs from startup companies, industry executives, ophthalmology leaders, venture capitalists, and even the FDA participates. And, there, and it's, it's great to see that whole day where, where um, or all are dedicated to finding and developing new technologies to prove therapies for glaucoma patients. And then finally, the last day on Saturday is, the, is for the clinicians. Uh, the, on, in the morning, it's the uh, uh, glaucoma symposium, which is for ophthalmologists, and the afternoon session for the opto optometric glaucoma symposium, which gets down to some of the clinical science. It looks at the technologies and therapies uh, at past from the past uh, year or so and presented to the eye care professionals. I, I think um, if doc, if anybody, the listeners are interested, they can uh, reach out to, uh, or are interested in, in the, the Glaucoma 360 meeting. They should go to the uh, Glaucoma Researchers Foundation's website at www.glaucoma.org to find out more details. Uh, if you wanna attend virtually, I mean, attend uh, in person and virtually this year, you can be able to get more information at that website. And if you wanna register, please feel, free to do so. Any thoughts on that, uh, Dr. Wellesby? Uh, no, it was a great summary. <laughs> okay. Well, that concludes today's Ophthalmic Project podcast. I want to thank Dr. Derek Wellesby for spending some time with me discussing the Catalyst for a Cure team and celebrating its 20th anniversary, and not to mention the efforts of the Glaucoma Research Foundation in general. They're all working together to find a cure for glaucoma. And from what Dr. Wellesby has been able to share with us today, I think uh, we're on the right track, and I think um, both phys uh, clinicians and patients can have something to look forward to in, in, by the end of the decade. So thank you for listening, and have a good day.